Hey guys, how you doing? It's Matt again from Anti-Edge. You're speaking to the founder himself. Today, what I'm going to be talking about is specifically Bitcoin. Before we start, click that subscribe button. So that way, when you see our videos, you could be up to date with all the information that we're out here to give you guys. I am not giving you financial advice and I'm not qualified to be doing so. As long as you understand that, we should have no issues with these videos. Now, why am I going to take the time to break down Bitcoin when all these other altcoins are popping off? Well, there's an extreme importance to it so that way people could understand exactly what's happening i'm gonna go briefly over like very briefly over the history over the last few years of what bitcoin is and why it exists and what the blockchain is bitcoin is basically the first successful cryptographic money that has been stored in a blockchain which is a type of data storage or data entry mechanism we'll say what blockchain is is imagine what it is is it's Basically, a block is a block of information. And in Bitcoin's case, it's about one to four megabytes, depending on if you're using SegWit and this, but that's technical jargon. It doesn't mean nothing. What matters is that it's one megabyte block, meaning that in that one megabyte, you could fit one megabyte worth of transactions. And basically, that's what causes, let's say, the difficulty and the electricity costs of Bitcoin. So as the network grows, there's going to be more people who need to make those transactions happen, right? And that basically creates energy consumption and that energy consumption is what actually backs the cost of bitcoin if you see that it costs ten thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars worth of electricity to mine a bitcoin you know that the minimum you're going to sell it is for the electricity costs which means that to some degree bitcoin is backed by something what else is backing bitcoin now what else is backing bitcoin is the lore and you're going to be like lore what do you mean by lore well the same idea that you would pick up a, a, a book and read a fantasy, it's the same idea. It all started in 2008 during a, the Great Recession. There was a Occupy Wall Street movement. It was huge. And it was basically the world saying like, hey, stop fucking us. Stop taking all our money. You know what I mean? Like stop doing shady things and destroying basically everyone's means of existence for your own greed. And that's basically what started Bitcoin. An anonymous founder or pseudonym or group of people, whatever you want to call it, named Satoshi Nakamoto, came up with this encrypted money. And what made it so special was the fact that it had a fixed supply. It was immutable, meaning that you cannot tamper with the information on the blockchain. Once it's been set into a block, that's it. And then from there, because it's immutable, that makes it censorship resistant, meaning that you could send it pretty much anywhere without having any central authority trying to take it from you. And that's part of what makes decentralization so special. The ability to get away from a centralized entity controlling what you're doing with your finances. You know, like if you have a bank account and you go to withdraw a thousand dollars, they'll ask you, why are you withdrawing? Well, because it's my money and it's my prerogative if I want to withdraw it. And Satoshi Nakamoto understood that where we're going, we need that kind of money, the ability to send elsewhere, the ability to not necessarily have to answer to someone when we want to access our funds that we work so hard for. And not just that, but when they try to steal our purchasing power through inflation, Bitcoin is actually kind of what stops that because it's a deflationary asset. There will only be less Bitcoin. There's a fixed supply of 21 million. Of that 21 million, there will only be less. Every time someone loses their wallets, every time someone basically loses their keys from there, what it is, is just there's less in circulation. And then the crazy thing is this, if there's less in circulation, but the money's still locked in the network, does that mean that Bitcoin could actually go to zero? Not really. Because then from a, the from a theoretical perspective, because people can't actually pull out their value, then Bitcoin's theoretical zero would actually be closer to like 50 or 100 bucks. Wouldn't actually be a complete zero just because people can't get it out of the network and then from there it's like you understand that this this is a very mathematically sound system when you actually look at the white paper and how it was designed is for it to be a six figure to a seven figure asset and what does that mean well bitcoin basically is backed by about eight decimal points meaning that from the zero there's eight decimal points that it could be divided into. Whereas usual currency is two decimal points. So Bitcoin is more divisible, meaning that as it grows in value, technically every decimal will eventually have more value. And how the system is designed is that by the end of this, by the end of it, when more market cap has basically been brought into it, every decimal point should have almost like a fixed nominal value at that point. Where it's like, let's just say a Satoshi, which is the decimal that explains what a, what every point is let's say you have at the end of the decimal chain you have one 
at number one. That is one Satoshi. Then it's 10 Satoshis, then 100, all the way up to one full Bitcoin, which is about 100 million Satoshis. As you can see, it's like as the system grows, it's designed to be able to handle more people in the network through a deflationary system. A lot of people would say, well, this is this is complicated. What's wrong with the dollar? Well, the dollar just keeps inflating. And what do you what happens with a balloon when you keep inflating it? It pops. And then you know what? Everyone's sad because the balloon popped after. Bitcoin is basically the opposite. It's deflating the balloon. You look at something like that and you're thinking, okay, well, that's basically how Bitcoin works. That's the understanding. It's backed by electrical costs. It's designed to be six or seven figure asset. Now, what exactly are we going to do with that? You look at something like PayPal, which is, allows you to spend as little as $1 in Bitcoin. It shows that they're setting up the infrastructure for something similar to that. And there's another project called REN. And REN is basically wrapping Bitcoin within an Ethereum network. And they're trying to create a system that has a stable coin which is basically like a like a normal currency, like a US currency or a Canadian currency, but it will be backed by a certain amount of Satoshis, meaning they're already experimenting with the idea of backing a currency with Bitcoin just because it has a set nominal value. That's just one possibility in our future. Obviously, I'm not going to sit here and say that's what's going to happen. But the fact is that most of these tech companies that are experimenting with it are getting ready for that kind of future. We're going into a cashless society and COVID just accelerated it. And the reality is that when you have information stored in a blockchain that's intamperable, but not only intamperable, it's being upheld by nodes. And what nodes are is basically any computer in the world that has the Bitcoin blockchain downloaded onto it. And what that does is imagine every computer is just constantly refreshing and watching the blockchain. Let's say you decide I want to hack Bitcoin, which is theoretically impossible, but let's just say you tried. In order for you to do that, you need to hack 51% of the network in order to actually hold Bitcoin's, let's say, processing power for a few seconds. So you'd have to hack 51% of the world's largest network on the internet, larger than Facebook, larger than all these things. Bitcoin is the biggest by a lot. You would have to hack 51% of that network in order to actually do something. And then from there, theoretically, let's say you do something, you you, you only have a few second window and it'll be very costly to actually be able to do that because you need a lot of computers. You need a lot of processing power. And even with quantum computing, think about it. One quantum computer is $10 million and more. How many people have that hardware? And even then, you would probably need a lot of quantum computers to actually do something to Bitcoin. So that's what kind of makes it secure. It's the fact that you know that you can't just hack it. Whereas you see, you look at banks, they're constantly being frauded and Whenever they get frauded, that money exits circulation and then they're forced to print more to keep up with what's being stolen from them. Not just that, but once it's in a blockchain, once your money is blockchain money, you see where everything's moving. So if you force a politician or a banker or someone along those lines to be using a blockchain address to do their transactions, you'll see exactly where the money goes. And the second you see it go where it's not supposed to, you'll be like, hey, what's happening here? Whereas in the current system, if something like that happens, who's, who's really going to know other than a banker or, or the people who do it? No one. That's the beauty of Bitcoin. It's a public network. Everyone could participate and it's transparent. And anyone who says it's not transparent it's because they don't really understand it. The second you register your wallet to your name, it's transparent. Till then, fine. It's not It's not as easy to trade. But let's say you want to buy a house or a car with Bitcoin, you'll have to put your name down. Now your wallet's public. If you're just using it in the local peer-to-peer -peer economy, that's very different. Then you could be almost using it like a virtual IOU. I give you X amount of Bitcoin, which is set at this value, and you could convert your IOU whenever you need it. But till then, hold it and figure out what you're doing with it. One of the other things that I wanted to mention was how Bitcoin is actually changing the world. And this one's pretty important because a lot of people, they overlook what it actually provides. And what does it provide? A lot of people, they're saying, oh, it's just internet money and only the drug dealers use it and bad people. It's like, it's not really that simple. Because you look at places like Venezuela and Lebanon now, and even uh, Nigeria, if I'm correct, places where they're experiencing heavy hyperinflation to the point where their currency is worth nothing. They can't go on a global market and use their currency. So what do they do? They mine Bitcoin and then they sell the Bitcoin on the open market for US dollar to get water and whatever necessities they need to survive. Now it becomes one of those things where it's like Bitcoin is becoming almost a humanitarian asset for the third world. The only way they could avoid being penalized for, I guess, being late in the development series and being conquered 
by these old, old, I guess, uh, Republican empires, Republic empires, or however you want to put it, these old systems that basically slave the world around them. This is their way out of it. So for a lot of people, you realize that Bitcoin isn't necessarily something that's evil and used for drugs and illicit activities. Because the reality is this, you look at the American dollar, and that's for sure funded way more illicit and illegal and bad activities than Bitcoin. My perfect example of that is just look at Pablo Escobar. The guy had so many billions of dollars of American cash that it was literally being eaten in the walls by rats because he couldn't spend it. Bitcoin solves that. I'm gonna wrap it up and just keep it brief on Bitcoin because there's just so much to talk about it and I'd like to be able to talk about it more in a different video. Once again, like, comment, subscribe, follow us and have a great day.